proceed. Uh, the I'll introduce the next panel shortly. Um, just flowing on from the previous two panel conversations, things like recognising that a lot of good things have been done in the past, but just that last presentation started to highlight things around power and resource disparity and the imbalances that that has on advancing Indigenous language and so forth, but also to recognise that the predominant conversation has been about Indigenous languages um, and there's ongoing conversations as you proceed that will take in other language groups, uh, multilingual, multicultural language groups, which includes Indian, Italian, Greek, Chinese, all different groups that are all part of this country. Um, going back to your question about language, we're still a we still in this country live in a fragile state of mind. We're still trying to assert certain things. Um, historically, what was the plan here was to dilute the culture, the language and the story. And that's stuff we still have to grapple with. The other thing I'll say in terms of language is the wording which comes in around settler. For the first hundred years, it wasn't about settlement. It was about invasion. So we need to own that and, and get beyond our own fragility and own this because you're part of a history moving forward in the next hundred years. That's, that's what we've got to recognise collectively. The only other thing I want to say, coming from the conversation, language is in song, ceremony, story, art. So there's a whole lot of dimensions of language. Uh, and also to acknowledge that there'll be reverse racism and psychological trauma that comes back. When I listen to Nick, he's obviously spent a long time and invested a lot of time and effort into this space, but he could very well be confronted by Aboriginal people who will judge him because of his skin colour. Uh, and that's important. So we've got to work together on this together, come together and stand united because it's an important transition in the next hundred years. That said, I'll introduce the panel members for the next conversation, which is about oral histories and the co-design process. And we have Alastair, Alastair Thompson from Monash, Jackie Oldman, National Film Sound Archive, Vanessa Russ, Indigenous Data Network, University of Melbourne, and Sophia Sambon, Queensland Art, Art Gallery. Yeah. Thanks, I'm Al Thompson. I'm from Wurundjeri Country. International Oral History Association and delighted to be here and was delighted to be invited partly because oral history collections in Australia are facing uh, a desperately urgent problem. All of you will know that uh, people have been collecting uh, and recording people's voices, languages and life stories in Australia for many, many years, whether it was in linguists and anthropologists, for example, this recording with Fanny Cochran Smith in the late 1890s, a Palawa woman in Tasmania. Uh, then folklorists and folk music collectors in the mid 20th century. The wonderful Hazel de Berg collecting interviews with elite Australians, particularly the cultural and political elite uh, in the 1950s and 60s and 70s. But then from about the 1960s, an extraordinary flowering of oral history work in community, uh, professional and academic context, partly because of the coincidence of the invention of the portable cassette tape recorder, which made it possible, uh, but partly also, up closer, sorry, I sort of forgot that I can't use this, um, and, but partly also because of 
the development of social history and the so-called his people's history and a recognition that our archives traditionally have held the records of people who've been powerful enough to create those records and get them preserved and therefore it's a, a, an impoverished archive and so oral history was really well how do we transform the archive and ensure that the, the stories of people who haven't recorded them or they've been recorded by other people about them how do we get their stories of their own lives whether it's working class Australians, Indigenous Australians, Australian women, queer Australians, migrants and so on. So a massive flowering of, of oral history projects all over Australia from the 1960s and 1970s. And our problem is that you can see here many of those collections are still whether they're old CDs, cassettes, reel to reel. Um, they may not have been digitised, they're sitting in academic studies in local history society, dusty cupboards, under people's beds. Um, and even the stuff that has been digitised, and those are some digital records of a project I'm involved in, in fact they're going to be saved because the National Library did the project on Holden with us, but there's a lot of digital recordings that are not going to survive either because they're not future-proofed unless they're linked to a significant, uh, unless they're ingested and, and preserved by one of the state or national institutions that has the resources to ensure that they'll be future-proofed. So we've got a real problem because there's just multitudes of collections out there uh, for historians of historical worth but for linguists of linguistic worth that are going to die, that are going to disappear and, and our whole archival aim of oral history to enrich the archive, we might actually, that, that aim is basically potentially dying unless we do something about it. So we've got some challenges. Uh, one of our challenges is about locating those collections. You can see, sorry, one of them is locating collections. You can see on the right there, about 25 years ago, the National Library of Australia did a survey of existing oral history collections all over the country and produced this book. Um, that was 25 years ago. It's not been done since. When I asked the National Library a couple of years ago, they sort of said, ah, oh, maybe not. You could Google it. You could find it on Trove. Actually, you can't. You can't find a lot of this stuff. So actually just finding stuff. So for example, Yarra Council in Melbourne did a survey a couple of years ago and discovered dozens of collections just in inner Melbourne uh, that were basically dying because they weren't being looked after properly. Um, a, a student colleague of mine last week contacted Andrew Jacobitz who made this extraordinary website on making multicultural Australia in the late 20th century and there are snippets of interviews on that and she uh, contacted him and he's retired. Where are the interviews? Well actually they're in his study at home, he's retired, they're going to die. Uh, interviews with extraordinary multicultural activists in the 1970s and 80s of Australia. We've got issues, even if we find and locate these collections, we've got issues about documenting them. Any of you will know that a, an audio or a video recording without documentation is, is almost useless because it's so hard to know what's there. It's so hard to make use of it. So creating decent documentation to enable access is really crucial. Uh, and that involves significance assessments, whether it, for its linguistic or its historical significance. Permissions is critical. Um, oral historians started thinking about ethics and permissions long before universities had, had ethics committees and have a principle of shared authority that's evolved in the oral history world around the world for many years. But basically, and a lot of our collections, our old collections, do have good permissions where people have had informed consent and have, have thought about where they want the material to go and they want it to be preserved. And indeed, that's a significant thing. Mostly people are telling us their stories because they want those stories to be on the record. But if those permissions aren't clear and if the copyright's not clear, then there are significant issues there. Digitisation is obviously necessary. Ironically, the most robust form record for many of our interviews is the written transcript because paper will survive in the way that a whole lot of other things won't. We need to digitise but we also need to future-proof those digital records and, and to be honest, most academics, most local history collections, most community projects don't have the resources to do that. So the really key issue is about preservation and future-proofing and as I suggested, I think only the large national and state institutions have the statutory responsibility, the resources, the skills to future-proof these collections forever. Um, if they stay in a local history society or an academic study, they won't be around in 50 years' time. Um, and lastly, uh, it is possible. Quality data uh, is probably less relevant here. It's a bit more like the research data co commons here. Quality data in the UK 
um, is, is a, a thing that's been going for about 25 years, collecting academic recordings. But more important, save our stories, the British Library got about 20 million pounds from the Heritage Lottery Fund in the UK a few years ago to create eight hubs all over the UK to locate, document, uh, digitise and preserve recordings, uh, voice recordings from all over the country there, halfway through that project and it has been transformative and we really need something like that in Australia. Thank you. Is that working? There we are. My name is Jackie. Um, I've come to you today from uh, where I live and work on the lands of the Ngunnawal people um, in what is Canberra, very cold country, and it's beautiful to be here. I pay my respects to Elders past and present and to all Torres Strait and Aboriginal, pe sorry, Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander people. Um, I was hoping I could go last to say what they said. But five minutes goes fast, so I talk fast. So I'm Head of Collection at the National Film and Sound Archive. Um, we are the National Audiovisual Repository, the archive. We obviously work very closely with our other um, national collecting institution partners um, on what is sort of loosely termed the distributed national collection. We all hold different parts of our, our national memory. But as lots of people have highlighted, um, there are gaps, there's a lot to be done. We're really excited about this, the concept of the data commons. We are excited about what we can learn, uh, but also what we have to contribute. Um, but I just wanted to flag some of the work we're doing, what we, some of the challenges we have, and um, the many gaps that we have. So we, in terms of oral history itself, the NFSA, um, and I pay respect to Sophia, who was a previous curator at the NFSA and knows this collection very well. We have a dedicated oral history program, not on the scale of institutions like the National Library, around 5,000 oral histories that are labelled and have been created as such. Very limited um, focus on First Nations people, and I can quite confidently say I think no, none of those oral histories are in language, and I'm looking at Sophia just to say I think that's right. Um, that is a gap for us. We know that we need to, do, to focus on that. We have just um, launched a new collection policy, um, and in that we have said that we want to focus on First Nations collection material and partnerships. So firstly, better understanding what we have, making sure it's described properly, and that we are managing it appropriately with uh, the individuals, communities or organisations who actually hold the, the cultural interest in that material. There's a lot of work for us to do. On the oral history front, one of the things we're embarking on this year is a pilot project on uh, Western New South Wales um, community radio, so a First Nations community radio project. And we really want to start to take our oral history program in the direction of First Nations uh, creators and audiovisual industry um, stakeholders. So I think there's a long way for us to go there, but we, we're, we're starting that, that journey. But as a lot of people I know have already said, in relation to First Nations languages, for us it's not necessarily the oral history collection which is where the, the information is. We have uh, material in our collection that is recorded in language. Um, much of it has been recorded over the last century for various reasons. Um, we have collections such as the Strello collection from Strello Research Centre which is around recorded uh, language and, um, and vision from Aranda Men. We've just been working with the Strello Research Centre and Aranda Men on digitising and managing that material and developing an access centre in Alice Springs for community. Um, I won't have time to talk about that, but if anyone would like to know more about the partnership that was developed to, to, to um, make sure we were handling that material appropriately and working with the traditional custodians, I'd be happy to talk about that. We also have, for example, the Central Australian Aboriginal Media Association collection. Some of that is in language. We're working on digitising that at the moment, but we know that there's a project there. Um, we need to work a lot more on understanding, describing and discovering that material. I'll just quickly go through, I know time-wise, I'm probably getting close to the end. Um, some of the challenges, and these aren't unique to us, I know many other archives, libraries, museums and galleries um, face them. 
the question of um, what is defined as oral history will be one that we will need to resolve. Um, that ties into the question about data and how we describe, how we bring our collections together um, and how we discover that material. Um, I also wanted to note the question about access and particularly in the AV world, there is an assumption that what we have should be shared and uniformly available. Um, we know that that is absolutely not the case in relation to First Nations material in particular. We have the copyright framework but also the ICIP um, and cultural rights framework that we, we work within. Um, and it's really important to us that we partner and make sure that accessibility is not always assumed and it has to be um, managed appropriately. Um, I've mentioned metadata. Um, and finally, I think that something, you know, the data portal is a, is a wonderful idea. I think discoverability for us is one of the key challenges. While our catalogue's available online, um, that's only at title level, and I think we have a, a lot of work to do on actually properly describing what's in our collection, making sure that um, the language used is appropriate and enables discovery, and I think that's where this discussion is really important for us. Um, thank you. Vanessa Russ, I'm a Narinian Gidjigal from the Kimberley region. I live uh, on the one wonderful Wajak Budja, um, and I'm really grateful to be here. I love coming to Queensland because um, it just reminds me of the heat of home. But anyway, <laughs> um, so I'm, I'm here, uh, I guess, not necessarily talking about oral histories, although I feel like I could speak to all of them. Um, I'm actually um, w work with uh, Professor Marcia Langton and Kristen Smith and a whole range of wonderful people on an ARDC project linked to the Eldaka project. Um, and we're looking at Indigenous capabilities. So our, our aim is to try and set up, uh, I mean, basically we're dealing with greenfields. Everything that you have all spoken about today, uh, all to me greenfields, because when we look at Indigenous data, we don't know what we don't know. And I recommend we all remain students of the game not experts in the field because, and I include this in, in terms of Indigenous people as well. It's really easy to say we need an Aboriginal person to do this thing, but we set them up to fail if they don't know what that thing is. And we also traumatise them more when they get access to things that they're not prepared to. So, so just kind of one of our challenges. So I'll quickly explain our project and you can ask me heaps of questions later. Um, so our project was really, okay, so what do we do with Indigenous data? What is Indigenous data and how do we actually make it functional so that researchers you know, like Clint and others can actually research them and not necessarily be Indigenous to research them because there are some people like Nick who've been working in this field forever and we should be actually sucking the life out of them and bringing that over to... <laughs> to, to and, you know, I, I mean, I mean it in a very loving way. <laughs> But I think that, I think we need to be a lot more open to it. So our project was really, okay, what is the whole ecosystem of data? Where do we start from? And, and so we started with governance. We've got three parts to this. One is, what is Indigenous governance? And this is taking the sovereignty narrative and actually applying it in a functional way. So it is not um, stopping anyone access. Caution, and I think I would love to speak to censorship, because I think we see censorship in every single approach. There is censorship to Indigenous people getting access and there is censorship to uh, non-Indigenous people who are working on par behalf of communities getting access and, and so on. So I think, um, so governance is one of the key parts of our, our sort of three streams and they all come together at the end. You know, we're looking at um, building a catalogue of where all the Indigenous data sits so that uh, as a researcher I can go, well I'm really interested in these things. Who has that? Um, and, and not to kind of say, well, you my bull have data and we want it now. Well, actually, no, I don't want to take the responsibility of having the repository work that you guys have to do. No, no, but can we get it up into a, some sort of federated system where I can look at it and then see if that fits within the research that parameters of, of my project, you know? Um, 
and in that there's things like looking at you know traditional knowledge labels and so on we're also looking at um, the complexities of data and how you know right up to um, geospatial types of data can you map country and then on top of that add collections and then on top of that add oral, oral histories um, and can an indigenous person then go on and click on a thing or can we actually um, start to provide places hubs for people to find access if they can't afford access. So really looking at the whole range of things, which is always really hard to talk about in these forums. Um, so our first project, which we did in June um, on the 9th and 10th, was to look at this, this idea of what is governance. Um, governance is one of the biggest challenges because uh, if you look at state and federal data, they won't give you access unless you are very special. <laughs> and so, what if we had access to some of that data right now in terms of those Indigenous kids in WA who are being um, inca incarcerated? I mean, we call it detention, but it's just incarceration. And then what happens to them when they come out? I mean, you know, we want to talk about evil kids. The system's creating evil kids. So, so, um, so yeah, so how does data improve our mob uh, without actually adding more limitations to the access of data? So it's... It's how do we do it in a way that's really ethical, respectful, gives time for pause, as lovely Sandra said this morning, and allows us to actually get outcomes that are community-based or research-based that then improve the lives of mob would be really great. Um, very ambitious, of course. Thank you. Okay, um, good afternoon. My name is Sophia Numpajimpa Sambrono and I'm a descendant of the Jingali people of the Northern Central Desert of the uh, Northern Territory. Um, I also pay my respects to the First Peoples and ongoing custodians of this land that we're meeting on. Uh, everywhere we walk in this continent is Aboriginal land and it's our responsibility to respect the lands uh, we live and work on and tread lightly. Um, so apologies for my pun, I'm a huge fan and I hope there's a, like a dad joke section in any data comments, uh, comments or system coming up. Um, so I, um, uh, I guess I'm going to interject with a, a bit of a perspective on the, the glam sector and um, just that um, not all collections are created equally or accessed equally, including oral histories. Um, I'll just switch forward to something more interesting. Um, so for over 15 years I've worked across GLAM institutions, currently at Kogoma, which I forgot to put on the first slide, which is the Queensland Art Gallery, Gallery of Modern Art. Um, previously I've worked at the NGA, the State Library of Queensland, National Film and Sound Archive, National Museum, um, and a little bit um, at the Old Parliament House before it was MOAD. Um, and um, in all of these, in some capacity with Indigenous collections, um, except for OPH. Um, and, and only two of these institutions were actually in the business of creating oral histories or dealing specifically with oral histories. But I found within each of these places that um, other sorts of content is um, uh, equally valuable, significant to community, especially with language, um, um, as, as much as oral history. So I'll just kind of talk about um, that sort of thing. Um, this slide here, um, is of some exhibition content we made for the International Year of Indigenous Languages at State Library of Queensland um, for the Kural Dargan exhibition, which is, uh, Kural Dargan is the, um, I guess, dedicated space at the State Library of Queensland for Indigenous stories and, and, and sharing and culture. Um, so as part of that, we created um, audiovisual content and it's um, in, talking about current projects in language, speaking language, and creating new sets of data um, about data sometimes as well, but also about what's happening in community. And um, a lot of this doesn't go into collections, and that's the same as, I guess, in a gallery world that I'm in at the moment, that will create um, audiovisual content that is about education, it's about um, um, interpretation for, um, online audiences, sometimes in gallery audiences. So these aren't collections or like the, the data sets that we think of if we're trying to design um, interoperable database systems. Um, so if we're trying to connect 
these resources? Like how, maybe that's something to include. How do we include these, these sorts of resources? Because it's something that um, you know, people spend a lot of t time on and, um, and the people involved in the projects invest their intellectual and cultural property in this as well. Um, I don't have a slide for it, but recently at Quagoma, there's a, a, a sculpture outside the front entrance of Goma that um, Judy Watson created. So she made that in response to archival collections um, and museum collections. And then we've created a, a digital experience that, um, that we created more content and audiovisual content to um, contextualise and, and create, um, I guess, a, a new experience around that. Um, so, yeah, the, we're, organisations in the glam sector are doing this all the time, whether or not it's within their actual collections. Um, okay. Um, this is a, a talk series that we used to do at the State Library of Queensland. I hope that's still happening. Um, there's a beautiful fireplace outside of Kuril Dagen, um where uh, we hold a talk series to talk about, I guess, um, projects that are happening at the library and exhibitions that are on at the library. Oops, I've run out of time really quickly. Um, but, but that is to say, again, that these aren't necessarily included in collections, but um, often uh, are the most interesting part of <laughs> uh, some of the projects that we're doing, because we're talking about collections, we're talking about experiences, um, like contemporary exp experiences, talking about um, lifetime of experiences. In particular, these ladies um, in the top right, they're Sherberg Marching Girls. Um, it was the last, um, I, I guess, the, the ladies that were healthy enough and, and um, present to be there, and they, they actually did a march through the space, and it was like a reunion. Um, so we had a conversation outside, but then we also worked with the, the collection area to record some long-form interviews um, as well. So they're in the collection, but the kind of, I guess, the spirit of the, the group isn't captured in that either. Um, I'll try and wrap up quickly and we can keep talking in the panel part. Um, uh, the next project I'll just quickly touch on, um, also at State Library of Queensland, it's about the other side, um, accessing collections for First Nations creatives who are, are in the business of um, taking that uh, data they've um, experienced, and um, in this case it was language focused, um, and then creating new, um, new exciting things to experience. So, but yeah, um, that process brought up lots of frustration and lots of, um, like with discoverability, um, with accessibility, with um, needing to, I guess, prep some of the First Nations um, creatives before we um, dive into these collections, how their family and culture is going to be talked about, and, and I guess the need to have um, like not just Indigenous staff, but, but uh, appropriately briefed staff or, or people that understand um, and are able to bridge those gaps uh, and prepare groups to be in, in the presence of these um, collections. Okay, I'll stop now, <laughs> but we can keep talking. <laughs> Thank you, Sophie. You didn't have to rush to finish because we've still got a little bit of time. Um, are there any questions to the panel from the floor? Uh, microphone to the. Oh. <laughs> thank you. Uh, thanks so much, panelists. That's fantastic. And uh, Sophia, thank you for agreeing to be part of the the day. Um, I think listening to you that you were you are probably one of the most experienced people in the room in terms of bringing data to life through those coordinated activities, um, uh, taking a longitudinal real life approach to um, objects in collections and bringing um, people whose lives or communities or histories that um, the collections encapsulates together. Um, that's just an amazing example that you provided. 
Um, you spoke briefly then at the end about the complexities of bringing people in that, um, in that example, First Nations creatives, into an institution of the glam sector, um, into close contact with the collections. Um, and you, obviously it's difficult to speak when we're speaking in the present and with real life examples, um, but you did indicate there were some challenges there. Uh, do you feel able to perhaps give an example or two? Um, so um, that example, well, that uh, picture series that we had was, um, I guess, creatives who had never been in um, the business of looking at materials and archives. Um, uh, and I, I guess that uh, some of that came down to the, I guess the responses were about the language and, and how um, they've been spoken about or the family's been spoken about in those archives. Um, uh, I guess derogatory language mostly, but also, um, yeah, I guess the, the feeling of walking into an archive is very different and very confronting if you're, okay, a, a Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander person, but also a, um, a creative. <laughs> like, it's a very imposing situation and, and it's nice to walk in there with people who are supporting you. Um, I have worked in this kind of space before at Film and Sound Archive where we um, were trying really hard to work through our, um, um, I guess, older collections which um, hadn't been looked at by um, um, anyone with the authority from communities for a very long time. So we brought um, uh, 10 um, senior men from um, I think it was eight different Arnhem Land communities to, to Canberra of all places to um, to to have a look at those recordings that we, that we had and to maybe take a step forward in, in um, I guess resolving some issues about those and and that was I guess my first time ever doing that but I guess the most difficult because it involved so many moving parts and and I guess um, I hope that that has made a difference to um, the NFSA collection. Um, but there, there is a lot of, um, lot to be said about having Indigenous staff in, in these institutions um, and, um, and support for them and also like networks of people. And, and what um, Sandra said before about, um, I wrote it down because I thought it was very um, uh, apt, um, that a First Nations mob within these institutions form their own communities <laughs> across um, across these these glam institutions and and, and I guess across um, academia as well and uh, and what you said before about um, when you call someone up you want to know that they're on the other end and they're gonna let someone in and um, and have that friendly um, face when you do bring someone into a collection and the respectful. Yeah response and that's important is that someone can be referred by you to me and I just nah don't worry about it so I damage your credibility um, for sending that person in the first place um, the other thing Sophia you mentioned conjures up conversations around how do we make this whole process culturally safe uh, and dignified because as you talked about cultural safety in the the institutional elements attached to that, that's an important conversation to continue to have as well. Um, are there other questions that people would like to ask? Nick, you hogging that hot microphone all day. Before I get everything sucked out of me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just thinking that um, typically, you know, when somebody approaches any kind of holding institution, you get a catalogue and it's like this is the truth and that's what's given to you. And we've been thinking a bit about dialogic um, archives so that where the people receiving the information can, can feed back into it and if it's made clear to them, and so we have a lot of recordings in our collection for instance which come from, you know, the Pacific but we have no metadata. We've got what's written on the outside of the tape and that's all. So if somebody comes in and says, well, this is actually my grandparents and this is what they're saying, that can go back into the catalogue. So we need to encourage people to think of these things as not being fixed and static, but being there for them to enrich 
and I, like you say, it's an, it's an intimidating environment to come into, but somehow we need to get that through. that we have in terms of our AIDC project is how do you actually get the reuse of data happening? So, and data can be anything, right? So how do you actually get the reuse? But then how do you get all the stuff that's been done already to come together as well? So we've got all this old, you know, some, some communities have had so much research done on them, they have no idea what happened to that research. And so, I mean, I know that, um, you know, Cara in the Kimberley is now trying to set up sort of this hub where all, all health data, um, health research is captured so they can see what, what's come before, but then also the new research should go in there too. And I think that that's the same thing. This is that green field. So, well, you've probably seen it for a long time, but I feel like we're in that, even with museums. I know at the Burnt Museum when we were going through and doing all that work to rehouse and digitise. My biggest worry was A, we were using EMU, so Axial, and what's the relationship with them? Um, but also then we were looking at things like how many names do you put on a thing? I mean, some communities have so many names, so we built it into the system so that you can put in whatever spelling and it'll pull up that same thing anyway because the burnts weren't great. At, I mean, they were writing things down as they saw. They weren't linguistics, uh, you know, experts. So, so yeah, so there's, there's that whole trouble around you know, the same thing, identifying things and taking the time to put it into your data, making your data clean, and then actually making sure that everything else then can sort of be magnetised to it, I think, right? the magic stuff, but um, that, that goes into that governance stuff, right? If we don't get how we capture data clean and nice and ready to go, it won't sit in a system and it won't be able to be findable and all those sorts of things. But there's also gaps in the care and fair principles as well that we're not thinking about. And I think this reuse, or reuse of data and um, continuation longevity is just not thought about at the moment. Jackie, you also, um, I'm, I'm sorry, Vanessa, I'll get more my, Jackie's, I'll come to you shortly, Jackie, but Vanessa, the, you mentioned the issues around governance and the importance of that as well. Um, <clears throat> when we talk about ethics, we've got to precede all these terms, governance, ethics, with culture, cultural. What does it mean? Governance to me would be about our law, our culture, our custom. Um, the governance in the Western world is about performance and accountability and quality assurance and all that sort of stuff that goes in there as well. So how do communities get a sense of knowing that the governance that's applied is responding to their need? So I think one of the best ways to think about it is there's two points to this. This is just data itself, right? We lose knowledge by not purely not caring for it in any kind of way. So there's stuff that old people have done and contributed to in the past that I think is probably sitting around in most collections, and I would include IATSIS in that. I mean, I think, if, you know, IATSIS is, it's, it's either really underfunded or, like, they're just overwhelmed with material. So something like that. Um, I think you're right in terms of cultural material, for sure, that it needs to be looked at from that cultural space. Um, but we're kind of looking at all of it. So in terms of the type of governments I'm talking about, it's literally, what do you do with the data that you've got on somebody else? So this mm. is that idea that we could, if we get it right for Aboriginal mob, we might actually get it right for all Australians. And so that includes your health data. Yep. What is your, you know, what if you could map, I mean, I think some of the work we want to do is with um, AX Brisbane here, um, looking at how they use data, they create a lot of data, how can they do better with that data to help the mob that come in for clinic? You know, so, so there's, mm. there's that side of it. So it is very big and broad. Um, but yes, when it comes to the cultural material, there would have to be an element of that. It goes back into um, knowledge of language, knowledge of culture, who is the owner of that material, really, um, who, who is the community, those things, I don't think we're there yet. I, I think we have some idea, but we really don't know, and that's probably through stolen generations, but it could also be through loss of old people, right? Passing mm. away too young and stuff, so. Mm. Or it could be because of past 
policy deliberately designed to dilute a culture and a language and a story. Yeah, and um, I think that that censorship thing, you know, when I was at school, I was told I would get the cane if I spoke language. So yeah. I, I have it in memory, but I don't have it as a verbal. Hmm. Um, so I think that, that that is really true. Old, but also that, like, you know, the old idea of, I, I'm really cautious, right, around the don't become the person that you don't like. So, you know, how do we as Indigenous mob come into this without becoming the oppressor because we've been oppressed? How do we stay open enough to not lose our minds, but open and kind enough to go, well, actually, what's better for culture and knowledge right mm. now? What's better mm. for that particular community right now? What are we going to do that's going to make it better for everybody right now? So, yeah, that's the challenge we have is we, we you know, it's easy to go down that path where you want to just kill the snake, right? Like, <laughs> but how do we get there without uh, and bring everybody with us is a really big challenge, I think. Um, and especially as culture shifts and changes, I was saying to someone earlier, I, I think we still don't even, we haven't even grasped that our Aboriginal culture has changed from la, like 20 years ago in in as human beings change, right? And in the next 20 years, young kids will be looking at the world in a totally different space to how we're looking at the world. So how do we keep that old conservative knowledge going is mm. going to be a challenge for all of us. So the sooner we get this data stuff right in terms mm. of culture, the better, I reckon. I think the answer lies in uh, some famous words I heard. <coughs> We're students in the field, not experts in the game. Uh, sorry, students in the game, not experts in the field, to carry that theme. Um, and come back to your comments, um, Jackie, where you talked about you know, shared, accessible, uh, proper descriptions, authority, um, what is defined and who defines it. That's, in a cultural context, very simply answered is right people, right country. Um, but then there's sociological gaps, which you've touched on just then, where I'll point to that old grey-haired fellow with the hat on. He taught me how to make spear, and he still to this day doesn't believe that I speared this mullet this big. <laughs> but, um, but sitting beside him is my nephew. But my nephew has had more access to language and archives and material than what I had and what this old fellow had, but he carries cultural knowledge above and beyond. So there's all these different dynamics that have got to be considered in the process of capturing data that is authentic and it's done in the right way and it's got to be done in a culturally safe, dignified, respectful way. So we need to act with honour, cultural honour and integrity, and we need to act and behave with cultural dignity and humility in all of your engagement processes in around this. And every engagement process is all about establish, build, nurture, sustain and value the relationships in this one space, yeah? And I'd say compete. Yep. Right? Don't just get to the end and go, oh, well, we did that consulting yep. and never come back. You should have a relationship with the people you work with for the rest of your life. Yep. Oh, until they die. Or to whoever dies first. Or to whoever dies. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's not a race. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Don't start bringing... You know what, you know what I mean. <laughs> Don't tell me... Yeah, I remember somebody else saying about not a race. Um, <laughs> or, Michael, just for your little bit of homework, I'll come to you shortly, Sophia. Um, where to from here? I hope shared governance is implanted firmly in your head and your heart. Um, before I go to Sophia, just to give you a wrap too, sir. Um, you gave a framework of which we could go forward to in terms of that UK example, locate, digitise, preserve. There's a basic framework that we've got to develop to make this happen. Um, but part of this is today, is coming together and at least sharing what you have and then a commitment to work together collaboratively. Sophia, you had a point? That I, it's great to when you're creating new data to make sure that it's done the right way, um, but for, I guess, new recordings and, and things that you're creating are new. Um, having worked a lot with historical collections, there needs to be more work done revisiting those collections. Um, we have fantastic um, computer-generated captions now, which will help maybe um, uh, make oral histories and, and audiovisual works more discoverable, but they don't work very well with Indigenous languages or non-English languages or, you know, um, hybridised languages um, 
like Creole or Pigeon or anything like that. It's like, yeah, you want to make these things discoverable for people to know that they're there and how do you do that within a system that's only capturing search words in a written form. Um, there's a lot of work to be done and I guess one of the takeaways from the last 15 years is that once something's in, in a collection, there was rarely anybody revisiting to tidy up data, to make things pretty, to make it easier for everyone else. Um, even um, having experienced multiple um, collection system changes, you think, oh, this is the point where we make it better for everybody. But really, as data sets getting migrated under new categories that make it more complicated to get to, like, uh, there's, there's a lot of things. <laughs> us to actually fund identification work and we all all institutions fail to do that we just get more 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 but we don't have the right people sitting in the right space going right this chunk of information I'm going to go share with that mob because it's got their reference to them and and then when we bring it back into the system we know for sure that that mob has a relationship to that material and we don't fund it. We don't even think about it. We go digitisation, woo woo, and like, Which is oh important. well, it's important we've got to save it. But <laughs> fifty thousand photographs, yeah. but we're never going to find out who those people are, and we're supposed to, we're supposed to remember yeah. who they are. Um, Vanessa, I want to put this to you. If you want to go and get your motor car serviced, who are you going to go to? to ensure you get the best quality service. So probably I'm talking about quality company. assurance. The company I bought it from. Not probably. You'll go to someone that's got the accreditation yeah. certification to do it. Yeah, yeah. If you wanted to build a house, who would you go to? Accredited builder, yeah. Yeah, a registered builder who's yeah. got all the certifications. You're not going to go to a builder who tinkers with his motor car on the weekends to fix your car, are you? Because the quality assurance is questionable. Yeah. If I want to go to Kununurra, and talk about indigenous language data in your part of the world, who have I got to go and talk to? There's a really great language centre there. <coughs> and they've been doing work with MOB and they've been teaching school kids and they teach everybody language yep. and stuff, yeah. Yep. And they've been collecting it for a really long time and they're yep. still... But they are <coughs> running off a shoestring and relying on the goodwill of people to keep them going. And informed by Murawang Gajarong. Yeah. 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 And to recognise that you've probably got a better knowledge of that place and you'll understand the factions and the clan situation, so you're the expert in that space. Mm. Well, <laughs> yeah. but, okay, but I'll, I'll go with you. I'll go with you. But that's where this whole process of language is. If you don't know, I need to ask you, and then you'll... That's how I come in, and when I talk to you, you'll yeah. give me that picture. That's the sort of stuff we've got to embrace in this process. Yeah, that's right. Yep. That's exactly right. Quality assurance. Yeah. Now I'm going to put a question to this young lady here in the maroon top. I'm going to I'll come to you shortly. You've been sitting there quietly. Have these people have been making sense. <laughs> Nobody's safe here. Have these people been making sense this morning, from your point of view? Yeah, definitely. It's super interesting. Um, so I'm a I'm a linguist, an applied linguist. So I don't do the things you were talking about before. I look at how language is in action, and so. I'm really interested in um, this question around how do we have a data place that actually can provide for all of these types of language use. So we talked about sound, we talked about video, we've talked about words written down being digitalized, but how do we, is there a way? <laughs> is there a machine big enough to actually put all of that, you know, to be able to see it in action? Because I don't think we can understand language with just a dictionary definition, and that's my my personal perspective of language. Um, so, yeah, that's the sort of things I've been thinking about while I'm listening to yep. everyone talking. Yeah, but thank fact, you. It's really awesome. This panel, I think, sort of gave a foundation and a framework moving forward there, but it comes back to that UK example, Alistair, who would locate it, digitise it, preserve it, but understand the, the cultural governance dynamics in around it. Do you want to respond to that? Yeah, and you've also got to connect it. I mean. I mean, my sense, it's the, the state and national libraries and the big museums, IATSIS, the War Memorial, the National Film and Sound Archive, they're the only institutions that have really got the resources and robustness to be able to do that linking, connecting work into which all the little collections out there that don't have those resources, no, no, need to basically somehow connect into. Now, no, to, to give them credit, the big 
national collections have been working really hard over the last two decades, digitising and making their own material more accessible, and occasionally they ingest other materials, and that's great, but there's a limit to how much they can do. But finding a way to actually enable all those little collections sitting out there to be preserved, to be documented and digitised, and, and to be then accessible and findable, subject to whatever rights and conditions uh, there are, that's really crucial, and that strikes. That's that's a real national coordination thing, and you know the British Library in the UK did that, but they had a lot of money to do that. But it, you know the National Film, sorry, the, the National and State Library Associations, for example, which brings together the state libraries and the other big collections and national. It's that sort of macro institutional basis that's going to enable what you're asking, I think. Um, but it's expensive. It's going to take. You know, it's going to take either a big mob of philanthropic money or something like heritage money, which is basically people gambling and then a little bit of that going into good things, which I'm not sure is a good model, um, or state funding, um, research funding. I was just going to add to that, and will. I think that's important because it's complex. I mean, we are, we are big and well resourced, and I think we have to be doing this. Um, there is work already underway, and you know, digitisation has forced us to come together and work on getting our systems more integrated. Um, we need to get our data sort of matching up, and the libraries are a great example of how they've worked together with a well-formed framework for describing collections and discovering them. Um, the other question then is resolving things like storage, just and particularly with audiovisual storage needs are huge. But yeah, it's that that technical joining up. But they're not insurmountable problems. I think we just have to have the will to do it. It's going to take us time, but that's yeah, we're starting. Well, that's actually what. We are going to look at what is a federated system. We don't think that we need to take people's data off them. We just want to figure out how can we like, tap in. So if I'm going, oh, well, I want to look at a group of photos from the South Australian Library and from your archive, can I actually do that at the same time? In the, and how would that work? So we're looking at big data lakes that compress. We're looking at all of that. We don't think that that's the way to go. We think that whoever has the data is responsible. But it's actually getting that data put together so that it can talk to other data, and that's some of the challenge. Um, but yes, this is the ARDC project that we've we've taken on. Um, so yeah, and the idea is is to work with what is already in existence. So um, IATSIS is already involved in this. Um, uh, we're also working with ANU as well. So we, we've got these really big kind of aims. It's really complicated and lots of things that we just actually don't know. But the technology seems to be ready for it. So we're kind of just getting the right build set so that it all starts to do kind of bigger versions of it. Um, so yeah, we'll be coming to people and asking how we can make your data talk to this system um, and basically, it will have to be some sort of formatted pro approach. So then this goes back into, can we apply different levels of um, controls around your data so that you can have to be an auth authenticated person, but you can then shut them off from accessing the data because you've found out that they're not using it well. So we're going to give the, the sort of controls to the owners or carers of the data, but also to um, community as well. So there's lots of different fingers in the pies, but we're working on it. We, the federal government, we, the federal government, and our state and territory counterparts, in collaboration with the GLAM sector, would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of these lands in which we live, pay our respects to our elders, past, present, and future. You've all heard that? Now here's a question I put back. How are we, the government, authentically doing what we say for you, the glam sector, and why are you having to rely on philanthropic dollars? Why is this not a national focus to talk authentically about the world's oldest culture? That's the problem. Clint, you got a question. Uh, thank you, everyone, for everything you're saying. It's all really resonating. It's all. It's all valuable stuff, and that last point you made is exactly what I wanted to try and articulate, and I think it's a, a worldview thing. It's like in this nation state of Australia, this very new nation state bolted onto 
this, you know, such rich and ancient ways of being and doing, people love building buildings. It's like most arts funding in Australia goes towards building buildings. Even IATSIS, yes, IATSIS is underfunded. Government just said we want to spend three, over 300 million on building a, a building. <laughs> More people? No, you can have a building. And I worry now, now we're in the digital realm, we're talking about building something else, building some infrastructure. And again, we don't want to get sucked into that thing of we're building something else and we're not investing in people, we're not investing in community, we're not investing in relationships. Because that is a story and a worldview that's much older in this place and that's what's kept it going for so long. That's all I wanted to share and thank you again. So funny that you should say that. A part of our project is also how do we get Indigenous mob trained up to run these things, to make them happen. You know, right now we can't really find Indigenous data scientists who are just starting out and want an opportunity to, to do a thing, to learn a thing. But they're really hard to find. And I don't know if that's because right now mob are just like, go be a doctor, go get into a hospital somewhere, you know. Or you could be a lawyer, you know, like we're kind of, or if it's just data science is so new in itself, I don't know. Um, so yeah, 100%, and, and that's why we think it's a really ambitious thing that we're asking for. That's why we don't want to take people's data off them. We think it should remain where it is. We just want to figure out how uh, you as a researcher can get access to all the things you need to actually come up with your findings, and then maybe build with the community new stuff, and then how does that get maintained for perpetuity? I mean, it's a big big interesting and it probably will include some of the big giants of tech maybe but who knows but the thing is that I think right now we all know we've got this stuff somewhere we just don't know how to get it out and get it back in you know like it's like that singing culture back to life you know uh, the one thing I found with the Burnt Museum I loved old men coming into the Burnt Museum they always knew somebody who knew somebody who could sing the, and they just start singing the song like that's his song I'm just singing it for him and so I think that that's the same with the starter. We have to just start singing it back to life. And so I think the aim is to try and solve our problems and make our community stronger through this practice and we just keep that there and keep building and working together. So Vanessa, what's the word? Can, yep. can I just add something on? It's a really good question. And it's a, I mean, I agree with you about buildings. You look at how much money has just been put into the Australian War Memorial to build this massive building and how many other cultural institutions haven't got that money, et cetera. But, Building structures of preservation is about people because you can't do the location, you can't do the documentation, you can't work on the permissions and the access, uh, you can't do the digitisation, et cetera, et cetera, without training, supporting, encouraging people both in institutions and in communities. So, you know, a, creating a really effective structure for preservation at a national and community level is first and foremost about people. It's about will and it's about money but it's also a lot of people doing a lot of really good work. A lot of them are doing it now, but it's about connecting them. Can I, can I just add something to that? Um, one of the things I think we're grappling with is there's an assumption that when a project is funded, so we had some money recently for digitisation, the people will come, that we'll be able to find the staff. To, and that's a real challenge at the moment, that we need to be more proactive. Um, yeah, yeah, and really targeted proactive work to... Um, you know, bring people in and train them up and make it a safe workplace. And, and I think we've really fallen down there. Um, we've started to talk to IATSIS and some of the other collecting institutions, but it's a long, it's going to be a long time, I think. Patience is a virtue. Um, there's a bit more to that. Vanessa, I want you to think of a word that rhymes with language, but I'm going to hand to Sandra. Um, on the question of where are the Indigenous data scientists, it made a series of thoughts pop up in my mind. Um, in the 80s, we were all going to be teachers and social workers, um, and then doctors and lawyers, and perhaps next phase is the technologists and data scientists. But in order to get there, we need people who are chairing or heading up professional associations like Julian, um, you're on some oral history association. Every leadership um, dimension of professional associations should get their action plans happening. How are you going to, and how is everyone else who's got some governance authority um, going to ensure Indigenous participation, excellence and achievement through your particular domains? So 
that there is a question in there too. So Julian, how does the Oral History Association do business in a way that broadens the base for Indigenous participation, for example? Who, who Julian first? Sorry, Alastair. Sorry, <laughs> you're the one calling everyone the wrong name, so uh, I'm just following suit. We're all, we're, all wondering, we're all wondering who your Julian is now. <laughs> That's okay. Um, I mean, the Oral History Australia is really a, a federation of state oral history and territory associations, and they're comprised of lots and lots of different people and doing different local projects. So, um, you know, but the coordinating... Yeah, the coordinating things we do are develop ethical guidelines. We've just run a whole lot of recent Indigenous oral history training events with Indigenous oral historians teaching us about their protocols, procedures, etc., etc. So, yeah, but absolutely, all of the different sort of peak organisations can contribute to this. So, Sandra, you and Julian uh, can have that conversation, that big lunch. Now, the, la the word I wanted to find, Vanessa, with language was sandwich. <laughs> And it's big lunch, and we've gone into big lunch, but thank you, Sophia, Vanessa, Jackie, and Alistair, Julian, uh, for your uh, presentation.